Compassion as a Vice Many of the female clients, perhaps even a majority that I see in my clinical practice, have trouble in their jobs and family lives not because they are too aggressive, but because they are not aggressive enough. Cognitive behavioral therapists call the treatment of such people, generally characterized by the more feminine traits of agreeableness, politeness and compassion, and neuroticism, anxiety and emotional pain, assertiveness training. Insufficiently aggressive women, and men although more rarely, do too much for others. They tend to treat those around them as if they were distressed children. They tend to be naive. They assume that cooperation should be the basis of all social transactions, and they avoid conflict, which means they avoid confronting problems in their relationships as well as work. They continually sacrifice for others. This may sound virtuous, and it is definitely an attitude that has certain social advantages, but it can and often does become counterproductively one-sided. Because two agreeable people bend over backwards for other people, they do not stand up properly for themselves. Assuming that others think as they do, they expect, instead of ensuring, reciprocity for their thoughtful actions. When this does not happen, they don't speak up. They do not or cannot straightforwardly demand recognition. The dark side of their characters emerges because of their subjugation and they become resentful. I teach excessively agreeable people to note the emergence of such resentment, which is very important, although very toxic, emotion. There are only two major reasons for resentment. Being taken advantage of, or allowing yourself to be taken advantage of, or whiny refusal to adopt responsibility and grow up. If you're resentful, look for the reasons. Perhaps discuss the issue with someone you trust. Are you feeling hard done by in an immature manner? If after some honest consideration you don't think it's that, perhaps someone is taking advantage of you. This means that you now face a moral obligation to speak up for yourself. This might mean confronting your boss, or your husband, or your wife, or your child, or your parents. It might mean gathering some evidence strategically so that when you confront that person you can give them several examples of your misbehavior, at least three, so they can't easily weasel out of your accusations. It might mean failing to concede when they offer you their counter-arguments. People rarely have more than four at hand. If you remain unmoved, they get angry or cry or run away. It's very useful to attend to tears in such situations. They can be used to motivate guilt on the part of the accuser due, theoretically, to having caused hurt feelings and pain. But tears are often shed in anger. A red face is a good cue. If you can push your point past the first four responses and stand fast against a consequent emotion, you will gain your target's attention and perhaps their respect. This is genuine conflict, however, and it's neither pleasant nor easy. You must also know clearly what you want out of the situation and be prepared to clearly articulate your desire. It's a good idea to tell the person you are confronting exactly what you would like them to do instead of what they have done or currently are doing. You might think, if they loved me they would know what to do. That's the voice of resentment. Assume ignorance before malevolence. No one has a direct pipeline to your wants and needs, not even you. If you try to determine exactly what you want, you might find that it is more difficult than you think. The person oppressing you is likely no wiser than you, especially about you. Tell them directly what would be preferable instead after you have sorted it out. Make your request as small and reasonable as possible, but ensure that its fulfillment would satisfy you. In that manner, you come to the discussion with a solution instead of just a problem. Agreeable, compassionate, empathic, conflict-averse people all those traits grouped together, let people walk on them, and they get bitter. They sacrifice themselves for others, sometimes excessively, and cannot comprehend why that is not reciprocated. Agreeable people are compliant, and this robs them of their independence. The danger associated with this can be amplified by high-trait neuroticism. Agreeable people will go along with whoever makes a suggestion instead of insisting, at least sometimes, on their own way. So they lose their way and become indecisive and too easily swayed. If they are, in addition, easily frightened and hurt, they have even less reason to strike out on their own, as doing so exposes them to threat and danger, at least in the short term. That's the pathway to dependent personality disorder, technically speaking. 
It might be regarded as the polar opposite of antisocial personality disorder, the set of traits characteristic of delinquency in childhood and adolescence and criminality in adulthood. It would be lovely if the opposite of a criminal was a saint, but it's not the case. The opposite of a criminal is an Oedipal mother, which is its own type of criminal. The Oedipal mother, and fathers can play this role too, but it's comparatively rare, says to her child, I only live for you. She does everything for her children. She ties their shoes and cuts up their food and lets them crawl into bed with her and her partner far too often. That's a good and conflict avoidant method for avoiding unwanted sexual attention as well. The Oedipal mother makes a pact with herself, her children, and the devil himself. The deal is this. Above all, never leave me. In return, I will do everything for you. As you age without maturing, you will become worthless and bitter, but you will never have to take any responsibility, and everything you do that's wrong will always be someone else's fault. The children can accept or reject this, and they have some choice in the matter. The Oedipal mother is the witch in the story of Hansel and Gretel. The two children in that fairy tale have a new stepmother. She orders her husband to abandon his children in the forest as there is a famine, and she thinks they eat too much. He obeys his wife, takes his children deep into the woods, and leaves them to their fate. Wow. Wandering, starving, and lonely, they come across a miracle, a house. And it's not just any house, it's a candy house, a gingerbread house. A person who had not been rendered too caring, empathic, sympathetic, and cooperative might be skeptical and ask, is this too good to be true? But the children are too young and too desperate. Inside the house is a kind old woman, rescuer of distraught children, kind patter of heads and wiper of noses, all bosom and hips, ready to sacrifice herself to their every wish at a moment's notice. She feeds the children anything they want, any time they want, and they never have to do anything. But provision of that kind of care makes her hungry. She puts Hansel into a cage to fatten him up ever more efficiently. He fools her into thinking he's staying thin by offering her an old bone when she tries to test his leg for the desired tenderness. She gets too desperate to wait, eventually, and stokes the oven, preparing to cook and eat the object of her doting. <laughs> Gretel, who has apparently not been lulled into full submission, waits for a moment of carelessness and pushes the kind old woman into the oven. The kids run away and rejoin their father, who has thoroughly repented of his evil actions. In a household like that, the choicest cut of child is the spirit, and it's always consumed first. Too much protection devastates the developing soul. The witch in the Hansel and Gretel tale is the terrible mother, the dark half of the symbolically feminine. Deeply social as we are in our essence, we tend to view the world as a story, the characters of which are mother, father, and child. The feminine as a whole is unknown nature outside the bounds of culture, creation, and destruction. She is the protective arms of mother and the destructive element of time, the beautiful virgin mother and the swamp-dwelling hag. This archetypal entity was confused with an objective, historical reality back in the later 1800s by a Swiss anthropologist named Johann Jakob Bachoven. Bachoven proposed that humanity had passed through a series of developmental stages in its history. The first, roughly speaking, after a somewhat anarchic and chaotic beginning, was Dach, das, das Mutterrecht, das Mutterrecht. <laughs> okay, a society where women held the dominant positions of power, respect, and honor, where polyamory and promiscuity ruled, and where any certainty of paternity was absent. The second, the Dionysian, was a phase of transition during which these original matriarchal foundations were overturned and power was taken by men. The third phase, the Apollonian, still reigns today. The patriarchy rules and each woman belongs exclusively to one man. Bachoven's ideas have become profoundly influential in certain circles despite the absence of any historical evidence to support them. One Mariha Gimbutas, for example, an archaeologist, famously claimed in the 1980s and 1990s that a peaceful goddess and woman-centered culture once characterized Neolithic Europe. She claimed that it was supplanted and suppressed by an invasive hierarchical warrior culture, which laid the basis for modern society. Art historian Merlin Stone made the same argument in his book, When God Was a Woman. 
This whole series of essentially archetypal mythological ideas become touchstones for the theology of the women's movement and the matriarchal studies of 1970s feminism. Cynthia Eller, who wrote a book criticizing such ideas, The Myth of Matriarchal Prehistory, called this theology an ennobling lie. Carl Jung had encountered Bachoven's ideas of primordial matriarchy decades earlier. Jung soon realized, however, that the developmental progression described by the earlier Swiss thinker represented a psychological rather than a historical reality. He saw in Bachoven's thought the same processes of projection of imaginative fantasy onto the external world that had led to the population of the cosmos with constellations and gods. In The Origins and History of Consciousness and The Great Mother, Jung's collaborator Eric Newman extended his colleague's analysis. Newman traced the emergence of consciousness symbolically masculine and contrasted it with its symbolically feminine, material, mother, matrix origins, subsuming Freud's theory of Oedipal parenting into a broader archetypal model. For Newman and for Jung, consciousness, always symbolically masculine even in women, struggles upwards towards the light. Its development is painful and anxiety-provoking, as it carries with it the realization of vulnerability and death. It is constantly tempted to sink back down into dependency and unconsciousness and to shed its existential burden. It is aided in that pathological desire by anything that opposes enlightenment, articulation, rationality, self-determination, strength, and competence, by anything that shelters too much and therefore smothers and devours. Such overprotection is Freud's Oedipal familial nightmare, which we are rapidly transforming into social policy. The terrible mother is an ancient symbol. It manifests itself, for example, in the form of Tiamat, the earliest written story we have recovered, the Mesopotamian Enuma Elish. Tiamat is the mother of all things, gods and men alike. She is the unknown and chaos and the nature that gives rise to all forms but she is also the female dragon deity who moves to destroy her own children when they carelessly kill their father and attempt to live on the corpse that remains. The terrible mother is the spirit of careless unconsciousness, tempting the ever-striving spirit of awareness and enlightenment down into the protective womb-like embrace of the underworld. It's the terror young men feel towards attractive women, who are nature itself, ever ready to reject them intimately at the deepest possible level. Nothing inspires self-consciousness, undermines courage, and fosters feelings of nihilism and hatred more than that, except perhaps the too tight embrace of too caring mom. The terrible mother appears in many fairy tales and in many stories for adults. In The Sleeping Beauty she is the evil queen, dark nature herself, maleficent in the Disney version. The royal parents of Princess Aurora fail to invite this force of the night to their baby daughter's christening. Thus, they shelter her too much from the destructive and dangerous side of reality, preferring that she grow up untroubled by such things. Their reward? At puberty, she is still unconscious. The masculine spirit, her prince, is both a man who could save her by tearing her from her parents and her own consciousness, trapped in a dungeon by the machinations of the dark side of femininity. When that prince escapes and presses the evil queen too hard, she turns into the dragon of chaos itself. The symbolic masculine defeats her with truth and faith and finds the princess whose eyes he opens with a kiss. It might be objected, as it was with Disney's more recent and deeply propagandistic Frozen, that a woman does not need a man to rescue her. That may be true, and it may not. It may be that the only woman who wants or has a child needs a man to rescue her, at least to support and aid her. In any case, it is certain that a woman needs consciousness to be rescued, and as noted above, consciousness is symbolically masculine and has been since the beginning of time, in the guise both of order and of the Logos, the mediating principle. The prince could be a lover, but could also be a woman's own attentful wakefulness, clarity of vision, and tough-minded independence. Those are masculine traits. In actuality, as well as symbolically, as men are actually less tender-minded and agreeable than women, on average, and are less susceptible to anxiety and emotional pain. And to say it again, 1. This is most true in those Scandinavian nations where the most steps towards gender equality have been taken, and 2. The differences are not small by the standards whereby such things are measured. The relationship between the masculine and the consciousness is also portrayed symbolically in the Disney movie 
The Little Mermaid. Ariel, the heroine, is quite feminine, but she also has a strong spirit of independence. For this reason, she is her father's favorite, although she also causes him the most trouble. Her father, Triton, is the king, representing the known, culture, and order, with a hint of oppressive rule-giver and tyrant. Because order is always opposed by chaos, Triton has an adversary, Ursula, a tentacled octopus, a serpent, a gorgon, a hydra. Thus, Ursula is in the same archetypal category as the dragon queen Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty, or the jealous older queen in Snow White, Lady Tremaine in Cinderella, the red queen in Alice in Wonderland, Corella de Vil in 101 Dalmatians, Miss Medusa in The Rescuers, and Mother Gothel in Tangled. Ariel wants to kindle a romance with Prince Eric, whom she previously rescued from a shipwreck. Ursula tricks Ariel into giving up her voice so that she can have three days as a human being. Ursula knows full well, however, that a voiceless Ariel will not be able to establish a relationship with the prince. Without her capacity to speak, without the Logos, without the divine word, she will remain underwater, unconscious forever. When Ariel fails to form a union with Prince Eric, Ursula steals her soul and places it in her large collection of shriveled and warped semi-beings, well protected by her feminine graces. When King Triton shows up to demand the return of his daughter, Ursula makes him a terrible offer. He can take Ariel's place. Of course, the elimination of the wise king, who represents, to say it again, the benevolent side of the patriarchy, has been Ursula's nefarious plan all along. Ariel is released, but Triton is now reduced to a pathetic shadow of his former self. More importantly, Ursula now has Triton's magic Triton, the source of his godlike power. Fortunately for everyone concerned except Ursula, Prince Eric returns, distracting the evil queen of the underworld with a harpoon. This opens an opportunity for Ariel to attack Ursula, who grows, in response, to monstrous proportions, in the same manner as Maleficent, Sleeping Beauty's evil queen. Ursula creates a huge storm and raises a whole navy of sunken ships from the ocean floor. As she prepares to kill Ariel, Eric commandeers a wrecked ship and rams her with its broken bowsprit. Triton and the other captured souls are released. Hooray! <laughs> The rejuvenated Triton then transforms his daughter into a human being so she can remain with Eric. For a woman to become complete, such stories claim, she must form a relationship with masculine consciousness and stand up to the terrible world, which sometimes manifests itself primarily in the form of her too present mother. An actual man can help her do that, to some degree, but it is better for everyone concerned when no one is too dependent. One day when I was a kid, I was out playing softball with some friends. The teams were a mixture of boys and girls. We were all old enough so that the boys and girls were starting to be interested in one another in an unfamiliar way. Status was becoming more relevant and important. My friend Jake and I were about to come to blows pushing each other around near the pitching mound when my mom walked by. She was a fair distance away, about 30 yards but I could immediately see by the change in her body language that she knew what was going on. Of course, the other kids saw her as well. She walked right by. I knew that hurt her. Part of her was worried that I would come home with a bloody nose and a black eye. It would have been easy enough for her to just yell, Hey, you kids, quit that! Or even to come over and interfere. But she didn't. A few years later, when I was having teenage trouble with my dad, my mom said, if it was too good at home, you'd never leave. <laughs> My mom is a tender-hearted person. She's empathetic and cooperative and agreeable. Sometimes she lets people push her around. When she went back to work after being at home with her young kids, she found it challenging to stand up to the men. Sometimes that made her resentful, something she also feels sometimes in relationship to my father, who is strongly inclined to do what he wants when he wants to. Despite all that, she's no Oedipal mother. She fostered the independence of her children, even though doing so was often hard on her. She did the right thing, even though it caused her emotional distress. <laughs>